Let's open uh, this morning's service with the familiar hymn number 21 from your spiral hymn book, number 21. Let's all stand together, the covenant ordered and sure. <clears throat> God the Father and the Son and the Spirit three in one in eternal ages past made a covenant sure and fast God my Father chose his own in the person of his Son, and ordained that I should be one with him eternally. God the Son agreed to come in the flesh to bring me home. He would keep God's holy law and retrieve me from the fall. Christ in love so willingly stood as my great surety. For my price he offered blood to appease the wrath of God. God the Spirit, heavenly dove, promised to come down in love, bringing life and peace and grace to the chosen purchased race. He seeks the lost, heals the lame, and he brings us to the Lamb by his mighty sovereign call. God's elect are gathered all. This poor sinner is secure, for God's covenant will endure. It is sealed by God's own word, by his spirit and his blood. Blessed, holy covenant God, I am yours by ties of blood, ties of grace and ties of love. Hold me to my God above. Please be seated. Aren't you thankful to be able to sing that hymn with a little bit of understanding? Just, I mean, every word of that, of that hymn is, is so, so clear and simple and, and so hopeful. <clears throat> God the Father chose a particular people before time ever was. God the Son, the end time, came and accomplished the redemption of God's elect. God the Holy Spirit right now is doing his work, calling out God's people, bringing them into a loving relationship with Christ. And our hope this morning is that, that he will do that. This poor sinner is secure. Well, God's covenant is secure, is sure. <clears throat> uh, if you can't find your Bible, it's on the table in the back, so uh, look there for it. And uh, little musical pews going on this morning, so hopefully you figure out where to sit. We moved the front pew to the back. We're going to try that today and see how it works and may, may move it back, but... Uh, <clears throat> you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Peter this morning, 1 Peter 
chapter 3. <clears throat> Let's uh, pray together. Our merciful Heavenly Father, we find all the hope of our salvation in your sovereign will, purpose, power. Lord, we find great hope in knowing that, that you're not looking to us for anything any part of our salvation dependent upon anything that we do. That you look to your dear son and you delight in him. You're pleased with him. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would cause us to do the same. That we would find our affections fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ who is our Savior, our substitute. Lord, we thank you for your word. We know that we must have eyes to see and hearts to believe. We must be given ears to hear. And we know that we can receive nothing except to be given to us from heaven. And so, Father, we ask that you would be pleased this hour to do that. Glorify thyself. Lift up Christ. Bless your people. Call out your lost sheep. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> I've titled this message, The Answer of a Good Conscience. Toward God. The answer of a good conscience toward God. Let's read these verses together. And in order to understand the verses that we're going to be looking at, we have to back up to verse 18 because verses 19 through the end of the chapter, the Lord is, is illustrating the truth that we looked at last Sunday from verse 18. <clears throat> For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, one time, the just one, the holy one, the righteous one, dying and suffering for the unjust, the sinners, the, one, the ones who cannot redeem themselves, in order that he might bring us to God. <laughs> That's our need. Our need is to be brought to God. Our need is for the Lord to take us and bring us into the very presence of God and be able to stand uncondemned in the presence of a holy God. That is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ came to do. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. In his death, he put away our sin, and by his resurrection, he's proof that God satisfied with what he did. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is what these next verses are about. Um, as I said, these verses are illustrating this glorious truth from verse 18. By which, and there's much confusion in these next couple of verses, but I hope the Lord will make them simple and plain and clear to us this morning. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was at preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. They were saved by water. We think of the flood as being the, 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 the destruction of the world, and it was, but that same water that destroyed the world lifted up the ark. And in this, we see the illustration of what the Lord Jesus did 
when he died in the flesh and raised from the dead. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. And so this, all of this has to do with, with us being able to stand in the presence of God without a guilty conscience. The answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who himself is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. A good conscience. We know by experience what that is. A good conscience is a conscience that is absent of Fear and guilt, it's an innocent conscience. A guilty conscience is a horrible thing. We all have experienced it. Surely it is the cause of much anxiety. It is the cause of much fear. It is the cause of much trouble in this world. A guilty conscience. A guilty conscience is the means by which Satan, the accuser of the brethren, would take us away from our hope in Christ. He would would cause us to look to our lives and look to the law of God and, and try to use guilt and shame to draw us away from Christ. A guilty conscience is the means by which men try to control one another. They use fear and intimidation and guilt and shame. It's a horrible thing to have a guilty conscience. I hope that we can have a good conscience toward one another. I hope that we will live our lives before one another without offense and that when we do offend one another that we'll be humble enough to apologize that our conscience might be made clear through a sincere apology for that offense. But a guilty conscience, a a, a good conscience toward God? (laughs) The God who sees everything, the God who knows our thoughts before we think them? The God who, whose light reveals everything about our hearts, how can we stand in the presence of God and have a good conscience, a conscience without guilt, without shame? Before we answer that question, I think it would be helpful for us to look at verses 19 and 20 just for some explanation. Um, As I said, much confusion has been imagined in the opinions of men who don't use scripture to compare scripture. They uh, will rest the scriptures and they will take verses out of context and they will come to conclusions that, that are contrary to everything else we know to be true. You can read uh, the opinions of unenlightened men when it comes to these verses that, that would suggest that maybe the Lord Jesus Christ, when he, during those three days in the grave, that he went down into hell itself and preach to the devils in order to try to recover them. That's not, that's not what the Lord's saying here. That's not possible. It's not of any, that when, when, when the devils fell into hell, that was an eternal fall. We don't, we don't serve a God who's trying to convince them of their, of their need to, to come back. 
So that's surely not what the Lord means. Some have suggested that what this means is the Lord went into that place of death and preached the gospel to those uh, Old Testament saints that were living in darkness and uh, bringing them out of the grave. No, that's not what the Lord's saying here. Some have even suggested that perhaps what's being said here is that Noah was in the darkness of the ark preaching the gospel to his family. No, that's contrary to everything the ark represents. <laughs> the ark, even in this text, is the, is, the, is the means of life. And we know that that ark is a picture of Christ. We know that Noah is a picture of Christ. <laughs> Uh, Noah's name translated means rest, and our rest is in Christ. And these, and these eight souls that were in the ark to which God closed the door to and was, was raised above the destruction of the world by the very water that destroyed the earth, I'm sure they were worshiping and, and delighting in the Lord's mercy in that ark. But that's not what this is talking about. Turn with me to chapter 1 of this, of this same book and look with me at verse 10. And here we understand Scripture by Scripture. Scripture is its own commentary. Scripture sheds light on itself. And so we compare the spiritual to the spiritual. And here the Lord tells us in verse 10 of 1 Peter chapter 1, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace of God that should come unto you, searching or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So what the Lord is telling us is all the Old Testament prophets who preached the gospel of which Noah was one of, they were, they were moved by the Spirit of God. They, they, they did not speak of their own opinions. They did not, they, they did not uh, come to their own conclusions. They were, they were inspired by the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. So we see here that the Lord Jesus Christ was in his prophets, preaching through his prophets, before his incarnation, before he came in the flesh, in the body of a man, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to be able to redeem us who are cursed by the law, the Lord Jesus Christ, in his pre-incarnate state, came in the power of the Spirit and preached to souls that were in darkness. That's what Noah was doing during those, the scripture's not clear about how long exactly it took Noah to build the ark. Some suggest 75 years, 100 years, a long time. Long time. It's hard to put the timetable together when we just look at scripture. But, uh, but all the time that he's building the ark, he's preaching in the spirit of Christ to darkened souls telling them about the judgment that was to come. And that's exactly what we're doing now. We preach in the spirit of Christ, warning men. For we know that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. There's going to be destruction of this world. The difference will be that it won't be by water next time, it'll be by fire. And our Lord himself said, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? And the meaning of that is that there will be few that will believe in that final day of judgment. I certainly want to be a part of that few. So the Lord is using this Old Testament example of Noah's Ark and how appropriate an example it is, not only were men just like they are today, 
living in darkness without God and without hope uh, in this world, uh, engaged in just marrying and giving in marriage and eating and drinking, the scripture says, and just indulging in the pleasures of their own flesh and without any thoughts for the things of God. And then Noah, the first time the word grace is used is found in Genesis chapter 6. The first time we find the word grace in the Bible, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was just like the rest of everybody. And you and I are just like the rest of the world. <laughs> if the Lord left us to ourselves, there's no difference. that We would, be, we would, be, uh, we would have no concern for our souls whatsoever. We must... Be found in God's grace. The Lord has to do something for us. He has to arrest us. He has to call us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He has to make his grace irresistible to us. And he does that in spite of us. The Lord's not looking to find someone who's uh, spiritual and then uh, blessing them. No. Saul of Tarsus calls himself a pattern for salvation. And he was, of all men in the Bible, he was at enmity with God. He was, he was breathing out threatenings. He was a blasphemer. He, was, he hated Christ. He hated the gospel. And the Lord arrested him, stopped him in his tracks. And there's, the, there's what God did to Noah, and that's what he's still doing. So by the Spirit of Christ... The gospel is being preached to souls who are in darkness. That those who find grace in God's sight, and the very first time the word covenant is used in the Bible is also found in Genesis chapter 6. And how important a covenant is, the promise of God. The hope of our salvation is not determined by our promises to God. That's a, that's a free will works gospel. Men think, well, I've, you know, I've made a covenant with death and I, with hell I'm in agreement. And God says, I'll disown no, your covenant. Your promises don't work. Why? Because we're not faithful to them. We're not faithful to our promises. God said to Noah, I'll make a covenant with you. <laughs> and there's our hope. So what the Lord's doing is he's going, he's, he's using the, the illustration of Noah and the ark and the preaching of the gospel by the Spirit of God and the judgment that came upon the earth and the raising up of the ark of God's elect in saving them in Christ, which ark was pitched, and that word pitched means covering, which is the same word for atonement. And so we have an atonement, we have a covering so that the, 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 the water that that comes down from heaven and, and ultimately the fire of God's wrath cannot come to us. You know, he, it always is, amuses me to see men trying to portray Noah in the ark and he spends all of his time trying to plug up holes. <laughs> uh, I, I, I heard that that ark that they built up there in Kentucky, I think it's in Kentucky or Ohio, right there on the border somewhere, uh, that the, the, manu the, the people that made that thing filed an insurance claim against their insurance company for some damages that were done and the water was getting in the ark. <laughs> Not a single drop of water came into that ark that Noah was in. Not one drop of water. And not one drop of water will come against those who are in Christ. Not one ounce of God's wrath. The Lord Jesus Christ consumed all of that himself on Calvary's cross. So that's what this, these verses, it's not talking about what the Lord did during his death and going down into hell or Sheol and preaching to devils or to, to lost men. He's talking about what Noah did in the spirit of Christ when he preached the gospel before the, before the judgment of God and saying that this same truth, this same judgment is coming again. And the hope that we have
is that God will make a covenant with us. His promises are sure. His promises are steadfast. He's faithful to his promises. He cannot lie. We have a strong consolation and a good hope. We have an anchor for our soul in the Lord Jesus Christ who went into the veil. He went into the holies of holies. He ascended it. That's what, our, our, look at the last verse of, uh, that, we're, that we're considering here in verse 22. Who himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, is gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Here's the hope of having a good conscience toward God. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So that we are in him unblameable, <laughs> unreprovable in the sight of God. You say, well, my conscience convicts me all that I feel like I live with a guilty conscience. Here's the only thing that's going to enable us to come into the very presence of God with boldness. To come before the, the throne of grace with boldness is to believe the gospel is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself consumed all the wrath of God and put away our sin. It speaks of baptism here. I'm not talking about water baptism. By the way, we're, Lord willing, going to observe water baptism next, next Sunday. Uh, Billy Argaropoulos from St. Petersburg is coming over and bringing the congregation from there and, and I'm going to baptize him. And we're going to have lunch together after service and enjoy that fellowship together along with the congregation in uh, Lakeland in Mulberry, Florida. They're going to come with their pastor. So y'all be sure to uh, be here next Sunday. It's going to be a very special time. But when the, when the Lord's talking about baptism, he's saying that baptism was prefigured by the flood. The washing of the water. God sent this flood to cleanse the earth. And the same flood that cleansed the earth lifted up the ark. <laughs> the same wrath of God that fell upon the Lord Jesus Christ lifted up those in Christ. <clears throat> He's talking about being buried with Christ in baptism and being raised to walk a new life in Christ Jesus. He's talking about spiritual baptism here. The children going through the Red Sea is spoken of in the scriptures as baptism. And so again, the Lord's using these things to, to speak of our deliverance and our union in Christ. That's what these verses are about. And you and I cannot have a good conscience toward God without understanding what's being said here and illustrated here by the flood. <clears throat> What the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished in verse 18 was all foreshadowed in the preaching of the gospel by Noah and the destruction of the world and the saving of the elect in the ark. What is the conscience? I have a good conscience toward God. If we're going to have a good conscience toward God, we need to understand something about, we, we all know by experience what the conscience is. Turn to me to uh, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. We've been falsely accused and we've, we've comforted ourselves in having a clear conscience, though accusations are false. I hope that'll be the case when the accuser of the brethren falsely accuses us of not keeping God's word, of not keeping his law, that our conscience will be made clear by the spirit of God through the understanding that I have kept God's law. I have kept God's law. I'm not guilty of the charge that you're making against me. I've kept it perfectly. Perfectly. <clears throat> 
Look at Romans chapter 2 at verse 14. <clears throat> For when the Gentiles, and the difference, the difference between the Gentiles and the Jews is that the Gentiles had no revelation of truth given unto them. They were born in darkness. They lived in darkness. The law of God and the word of God only came through the Jews. It only came to Israel. So here the Lord's illustrating those who have no understanding whatsoever of the things of God. They've never been, they've never been exposed to the Ten Commandments. They've never been exposed to the prophets, to Moses, to any of the, any of the revelations that are made in all of Scripture. They have no concept of God's word when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law these having not the law are a law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile, accusing or excusing one another. Now, what the Lord is saying is that you don't have to know anything about the Bible to have the law of God written on your heart. All men come into this world with that law written on their hearts. <laughs> you, you, you know the difference between right and wrong. You're, you have a conscience that tells you. Now, the Lord tells us in, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 4 that we can sear our conscience as with a hot iron. And um, just like a, a wound that's a terrible burn might not ever recover its feeling in that area. The nerves are destroyed and there's no feeling there anymore. And that's what the Lord's illustrating our conscience. He said, every time you, you, you call evil good and you call good evil, you can sear your conscience so that it loses its ability to work. It no longer has any feeling to it. Um, and, and he's talking about the unbeliever there. And certainly we, we see a national searing of the conscience in men calling good evil and evil good and, and, and losing their, their understanding of uh, and, and their, their ability to feel any sense of shame uh, for having done wrong. That's not possible for the child of God. You can't see your conscience. Now, we, we, it's the Lord, the Lord's going to make sure <laughs> that's, that's the work of the spirit of God. He, uh, do we, do we violate our conscience? Every time we sin, we do. And the spirit of God renews that conscience and causes us to, to know the difference between right and wrong. And he convicts us of our sin and of our, our, our unbelief and our, our righteousness before God <laughs> in Christ, that's the work of the Spirit of God. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come. But when he comes, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me. And so, child of God, every time you violate your conscience, the Spirit of God makes you know that that's your unbelief. And uh, of righteousness, that we, every time we have a, a proud, self-righteous thought and, and every time we hear the gospel and every time the Spirit of God brings us back to see that we had no righteousness outside of Christ, of righteousness because I go to my Father. And yet in Him we have a righteous, a righteousness before God, a righteous Savior, a righteous substitute. My little children, I write these things unto you that you sin not. Our Lord has given us much encouragement and admonition in his word to, 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 to flee these things. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. 
We have a perfect righteousness, a perfect substitute who has bore our sins in his body and put them away. How are we going to come before God in Christ? How are we going to have a clear conscience before God in Christ? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. When the accuser of the brethren takes you back to the law and brings to your conscience your your violating God's law, you just say to him, it's a whole lot worse than you than you're accusing me of. It's a whole lot worse. <laughs> but but I have an advocate with the Father. I can come boldly, not confident in my own righteousness, but in his. Not confident in my own ability, but in his. I can have a good conscience before God by the resurrection. No, go back. Hold your finger there in Hebrews 9 and go back with me to our text. In verse 21, but the answer, here's the answer. We answer these accusations. We answer these fears. We answer this guilt. We answer the shame of our sin, which we, which we have continually. Isaiah put it like this. He said, we have sinned, and in this is continuance, and we shall be saved. <laughs> so... Here we, we come, an answer. We answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The positive proof that our sin's been put away once and for all. It's been buried. It's been covered by the blood. God says, I've separated your sin from you. It is no more. You're justified in the Lord Jesus Christ. That word justified means to be without sin. So here's our answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is the evidence. It is the proof that God has given us that what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished on Calvary's cross was successful. What did he accomplish? He accomplished the putting away of our sin by the sacrifice of himself once and for all. This is the only way to have an answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here's the picture of the ark being raised up by the very waters, saved by water, saved by water. You have your Bibles open to Hebrews chapter 9. Look with me at verse, at verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained, past tense, eternal redemption for us. Now, the covenant is an eternal covenant. Salvation is eternal life. That means it never had a beginning. But it had to be obtained, and it was obtained through the sacrifice that the Lord Jesus made on Calvary's cross. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifers sprinkled the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh... He's going back to the Old Testament rituals now where the water was sprinkled and the blood was sprinkled of these animals on the elements that were used in worship. 
and on the people, the cleansing, the putting away of sin, all being symbolized in these things, all being foreshadowed in these things, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, this is the same spirit that we just read of, that went with Noah and preached to those spirits in darkness, the spirits in prison, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. He didn't offer himself to us, he offered himself to God. The gospel is not an offering made to sinners to be rejected or accepted. The work that the Lord Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross, he was offering himself to God as the sacrifice for sin. And God saw the travail of his soul and God said, I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. Sin's been put away. <laughs> There's how we come before God with a good conscience. A good conscience. Lord, you know my sin a lot better than I do. And, sin, and Satan would know it and use it against me. But here's my hope. I have an advocate with the Father. I have a sin bearer. I have a substitute. I have one who has obtained eternal redemption for me. Who's offered himself without spot. Notice the rest of verse 14. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. What is a dead work? A dead work is a work that we do in order to try to atone for our own sin. That's what, that's what men do all over the world. It's man-made religion, works religion, free will religion. And there's a dead work Pharisee in every believer. And as soon as your conscience feels the pain of your sin, one of the first things that we try to do is atone for our own sins. We, we, we have those thoughts. These are the dead works that the conscience has. And the more we try to atone for ourselves, the worse it gets. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't relieve the conscience. Did I do it right? Did I do enough? Maybe I wasn't sincere enough. Maybe I need to do more. How can, I, how, can I, how can I make up for this shame and fear and guilt that my conscience is convicting me of? We can only have a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here, by the eternal spirit, he offered himself without spot, without sin, perfect lamb of God who went to the cross bearing our sins in his body in order to put them away but himself was a perfect sacrifice God made him sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him here's the only way that we can have a good conscience toward God if we think we're going to have a good conscience toward God by somehow, well, if I just, ought we to pray more? Certainly we ought to pray a whole lot more than we do. Ought we to read God's word more? Certainly. Ought we to be better? Certainly. We ought to, we ought to do everything better than we do. But the thought that somehow if I can, if I can just do better, I can, I can salve my conscience only aggravates the conscience of faith. He went without spot to God and he alone can purge. We're not talking about saving our conscience. We're talking about purging our conscience of all those dead works, all those things that we thought that we could do. <laughs> to try to make up for our sin. They've been taken away by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <clears throat>
by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have this hope of being justified before God. Justified. <laughs> and that word means a whole lot more than just if I'd never done it. In Christ, you never done it. That's what justified means. Perfect. Sinless. <laughs> In Christ. There's our hope. Is not a guilty conscience the root cause of uh, fear, instability, conflict, <laughs> anxieties? Here's the only way to have your conscience purged. The only way to have a good conscience toward God is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I have a perfect standing before God. I can come boldly into the throne of grace, confident. I have an anchor from my soul. Justified. <laughs> Eternally justified. Now, contentious men who want to argue over words will... And I, I, I'm speaking from my own experience because I know I'm going to get some. I'm going to get some responses from what I'm about to say right now. They want to. They want to. They want to argue theology. Uh, they 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 listen to preachers. They want to teach preachers. They want to correct preachers. They want to. They want to rebuke preachers. They want to justify. You know, and I want to say to them, uh, Do you believe that you can justify yourself before God? They would immediately say, Oh no, we can't do that. I said, well, why are you trying to justify yourself to me then? But that's what most of these arguments are all about. Men trying to justify themselves over this topic of justification. And some say, well, we're justified at the time that we believe. And others say we're justified at the cross. Our justification, justification first is eternal. It's eternal. We're justified in the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. In other words, we were seen in, God, in Christ by God and loved eternally in him, never having sinned. Justified perfectly without sin in the person of our substitute from eternity past. That justification had to be fulfilled in time, and that's what the Lord Jesus Christ did when he bowed his head on Calvary's cross and said, it is finished. That justification can only be experienced through faith. And that justification, once experienced through faith, has to be renewed as we walk by faith every day. And that justification is not going to be fully realized and fully experienced until we stand in his presence literally without sin. In a perfect body. Now that's what the Bible says about justification. Men want to argue about it. Let them argue. I'm justified. In Christ eternally and in time. Let me show you that. Romans chapter 3. Verse 26. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. There's no salvation outside of faith. There's no, there's no, there's no hope of being justified. <laughs> apart from faith in Christ. 
Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay. By the law of faith. The law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now, free will works religion, man-made religion, makes a work out of faith. Faith is what you bring to make what Christ did work for you. It's your contribution. You're not completely justified until you add your two cents worth. And they make a work out of faith. They make faith a decision. They make faith a work. And in that, they completely misunderstand the whole nature of faith. Faith is just the opposite of work. We just read that. By what law? The law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. The law of faith is the opposite of law of works. In other words, faith is coming into the presence of God. I have no work. I have no understanding. I have no, I have no light. I have no hope. I have no truth. Lord, I, I, I cast all my hope on Christ. That Faith is the opposite of work. Faith is not a decision. Faith is not what we bring. So to say that we're justified by faith is not that I'm adding my faith to the work of Christ for my justification. It is, it is the confession that the work of Christ is all my justification. Do you see that? That's what the essence of faith is. Faith is the absence of all works, the absence of all knowledge. It is, the, it is the complete hope and rest in Christ alone. And so men who, who will argue over what God has clearly said here, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And they say, oh, you're adding, you're adding faith to the work of Christ for your justification. No. I'm saying the work of Christ cannot be believed. It cannot be effectual. It cannot be. It, it, faith, is the, <laughs> faith is the empty hand that receives the gift of God. It's the, you see, the very... The very essence that there's, where is boasting then? There's no boasting in faith. We have our conscience purged from dead works. Dead works is what men do in order to try to atone for themselves. And one of the things that men do to atone for themselves is to present their commitments and their faith and their dedication and their loyalty to God as the hope of their justification. And to, and to argue against that by, by saying, oh no, we're justified at the cross when Christ bowed his head. He was offered up for our offenses and raised again for our justification. Being justified, Romans chapter 5 verse 1, by faith we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't make faith part of justification. Because that, makes a, that adds a work to justification. No, it doesn't. Faith, by its very nature, is the complete absence of all work. That's what faith is. And it's a work of grace in the heart. It's a gift from God to bring a man to the place to where he has no hope in anything he's ever done or any work he's ever tried to perform. He has no hope outside of Christ. And Christ is all of his justification before God. Where is boasting in that? Where is boasting in that? We're not boasting in faith like the free willer is. We're saying that faith is the absence of boasting. It's the, it's the taking away of any hope outside of the accomplished work.
of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so by his resurrection and by his ascension into glory and by his sovereign control, we can come before God, before God who knows everything about us and have a good conscience. Not guilty. No fear. No shame. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's take a break.